Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24. Welcome to the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network. You are about to listen to an episode of the Audio Signals podcast with Marco Ciappelli. In this new season, Audio Signals is repositioning its antennas, focusing not just on the stories, but on the storytellers. In our modern hybrid analog digital society, the art of storytelling has never been more vital or displayed such a diverse array of forms. Recognizing this, our conversations will spotlight the narrators, providing a unique exploration into the minds behind the narratives. From authors to podcasters, visual artists to songwriters, and everything in between, we will engage with all who contribute to this extraordinary tapestry of human experience. We are all made of stories after all. Hello, everybody. This is Marco Ciappelli. Welcome to another episode of Audio Signals Podcast. Um, I don't know. I've already done like two today, so I, I feel like I'm playing a tape right now. So let me see what I should say. Yes, Audio Signals is exactly uh, what it sounds like. And we're trying to capture signals, although, you know, we're not going analog nowadays. It's all digital. But I repositioned this fictitious antenna to capture new stories and for those of you that have been following me for a while um i made a little twist and i i focus on stories and storytelling and storytellers because stories come from people stories are made to educate and are as i usually say we are made of stories even when we don't mean to say stories we actually do even the way we act, the way we move, the way we dress. We are we are our our own story. Now there are certain situations where you may think a little bit more of a story in the standard way to think about a story. Usually, it's a book, it's a movie, it's a it's a radio show, a drama as they used to do, and now we do podcast, dramatized podcast. So now that's the new. Uh, the new uh, radio show drama that used to be back in the days. But when you talk about books, you really think about stories. And today we're going to talk with uh, a friend of mine, part of the Mentor Project, that wrote quite a few books. He is a physicist and astronomer. His name is Neil Cummins. And uh, for those watching, as I usually say, you have already seen him. He's right there. And for those listening, I'm not lying to you. He's right here. So we're going to hear his voice. Neil, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here, Marco. Good. We've been trying to do this for a while, and uh, I'm so happy because we, we see each other quite a bit, uh, once a week usually with, the, with our meetings. And uh, I've always been curious to ask you a few questions, so I hope you don't mind. That's what I'm here for. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm going to start with the, the easiest one, which is who is Neil? I know you've done a lot of things, but give us a little background about yourself. Okay, sure. I am an astrophysicist, technically speaking. Uh, I got my undergraduate degree at Cornell, my PhD at what was then called University College, Cardiff, Wales. And my PhD was in the area of general relativity. And um, I was very fortunate to have a very good advisor. And we uh, published a number of papers. And one of those papers was actually cited in a Nobel Prize lecture back in 1983. And um, so I, since then, have been at the University of Maine. And uh, the backstory for that is that I grew up in New York, in, in the city and in Westchester County. And back in those days, it was a very rough area, especially when I take the subway into Brooklyn. You know, it wasn't a question of, are you going to get robbed? 
or mugged, it was when. <laughs> and I, I, I didn't want to bring, and I was, and I didn't want to bring my kids up in that environment. Don't get me wrong. I know it's changed, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, back in the, in the late 70s, I uh, opted to come to the University of Maine, and uh, I have been teaching here ever since. Uh, one cute story is that uh, after I got my PhD and people started calling me doctor, I felt very insecure. I felt insecure because I had no medical experience or background <laughs> whatsoever. So to overcome that insecurity, I became an EMT. And I worked for 10 years as an EMT here in Orono, Maine. Very satisfying experience. And that actually led when I was flying back from Japan one year, back in the uh, 2000s, uh, a woman died on the airplane. And they said, well, if there's a doctor on the plane, would you please come to the back of the aircraft? I know the Good Samaritan law, so I went back there and she was dead. And to make a long story short, uh, she walked off the plane, gave me a hug in front of my wife, but that was fine, gave me a hug. And uh, that was payment in full. So uh, becoming an EMT was a very satisfying experience for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I have moved on to uh, doing um, computer simulations. And specifically, I'm interested in galaxies like our Milky Way and how they evolve and uh, things like colliding. It turns out the Andromeda galaxy, which you can see with the naked eye, if your eyes are good, is going to collide with the Milky Way billions of years from now. Uh, so anyways, it's, it's a very interesting thing. And then I started writing books. And uh, <clears throat> the backstory for that, and please stop me at any time. Oh, go, go. You're making it easy for me. So <laughs> the backstory for that was that when my son, my son James was, yeah, maybe two years old, he was asking questions like, what that, what that? He wanted to know the names of things. And then he graduated by the age of four to asking why. And if you have had young kids, why, 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 why? And I did my best answer. Age five, he graduated from there to asking what if questions. Uh, <clears throat> like, uh, what, you know, what if this sun came up in the other direction? Things like that. And I did my best to answer those. Anyways. One day, I was sitting in my office here. You can see the background. And uh, my colleague, Dave Batuski walked in, and he said, and I quote, you know, we scientists think about the world too much the same, which isn't very good English, but never mind. So I said, okay, let's think about it differently. And my son's what-if questions came to mind. And I grabbed the first what-if question I could think of, which was, what if the moon didn't exist? And he and I discussed it for a few minutes, and I was hooked. I started writing, you know, papers uh, that were published in uh, astronomy magazine, asking and exploring many what-if questions. And that led to uh, my first book called What If the Moon Didn't Exist, which has actually 10 what-if uh, scenarios in it. And well, I'm actually going to stop you right there because... Uh, the what if uh, I feel like is the is the core of us being human, right? So talking about storytelling, like I, I love how your son didn't start it with the what if when he was younger. He had to, you say, graduate to that, yes. right? right? Like it's kind of like your brain needs to start maturing in a certain way, and then, and then, I feel like that what if question applies to everything. That's why give you an example. I, when I talk about cybersecurity, I talk about hacking a lot. And hacking is perceived as a bad thing. And I say, no, hacking is a really good thing. It's cyber crime that is bad. But hacking is exactly that. What if I take this system and I make it work in a way that it wasn't intentional and it does? Or what if I can do this? What if I can do that? And then you just Go for that. And I think the same applies when you do creative stuff. Hmm, what if I present it this way? So it's literally the question at the core of a lot of things that we do as human. We, if we didn't ask that question, we wouldn't progress. 
I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> well done. That was great. Uh, so I, I wrote the, my first book, and <clears throat> then uh, I was using a textbook in teaching introductory astronomy, and the author of it died suddenly, and I offered to take it over, you know, to, to write it. And so my second book was actually a, an astronomy textbook called Discovering the Universe. And um, to say the least, it did very well. I'll leave it at that. All right. And, and then I wrote a second what if book and many more editions of the textbooks. And then I started asking questions about misconceptions people have about the natural world. That became my next theme was to uh, identify misconceptions, identify why we have them, how to overcome them. And uh, I wrote a book about that called Heavenly Errors. Uh, and uh, I incorporate misconceptions when I teach, and I incorporate them in my t textbooks now. And um, I also wrote two books about traveling in space, if, if you want to go as a tourist, what to expect. And so those are the kinds of things I've been doing, and we're now 21 books into the story. Now, here we goes into this. Here we go into the story. So the story and this, the meaning of storytelling. So you, you create this scenario and that alone is even if you do it, you talk about a science. Many people think about science as, you know, mass and mathematics mm -hmm. and formulas. But actually, when you understand things, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Einstein itself, he was a very creative person, a very creative mind, like he could visualize right. his theory, right? I, I'm actually reading his biography now. That's why it comes in my mind. So the importance of telling the right story to appeal, and this could be to teaching, or this could be to bringing new, new generation in STEM. I mean, it's not just by the the math that you do this. So how did you develop your style? Is it anything to do with your teaching? And then you applied it in your book? What's what's your way to tell the story? You know, that was That is a terrific question. And the answer I think is very important. It's interesting because, you know, I give talks all around the country and and so on. And, and people come up to me and say, well, how do you, how do, you do that? I mean, because I'm, I'm, I'm talking about science things, just using words. And they get it. Right. And I see the smiles on their face. Anyways, <clears throat> the answer to your question is whenever I am talking, like lecturing to my students or writing my books, half of my brain is sitting there watching or listening to me with the perspective of the audience. So when I'm writing, I'm also reading. And it, to me, it's very, very important to make sure that with the, the mindset I expect that my normal audience would have, they understand, appreciate, and enjoy what they're reading from me. So that, that's the, the, the number one takeaway is to, to when I do any of these kinds of things, uh, I, I'm there in two different world, so to speak. Uh, and, and that's how I try to you know, make my work accessible to, to people. And I think that's really important because many times when people know a lot about something, they expect everybody else knows mm, exactly. a lot about something. And that's how we disconnect with the audience. So knowing who your audience is, I, I, it definitely is important. And, do, and, do, you, do you test with your students too? Like you come up with the idea and say, hmm, this could be a good story. Let's see how they react before you put it on paper. An interesting question. The short answer is no. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, when I'm looking for an, another thing to write about or another what if, uh, I, I tend to wander about in, in whatever realm that's in. Uh, by myself and ask myself what if questions until one set, you know, sort of resonates. And once I've got something that, you know, has an aha moment to it, then I'm off and running. Right. 
I love it. So what if the moon didn't exist? You want oh, to tell us a few yeah. things about that? A and also, what, what if you didn't have a character made in Japan uh, based on you? What, what if? if there okay, was well, maybe I should <laughs> explain that first. Yes, because I, I don't know. So, you know, I'm cheating. I already know the story. Right. A bit. Fair enough. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, in 2003, I got a cold call from a major uh, movie production studio in Japan uh, called Robot Inc. And they said that there is going to be in 2005 a, a World Expo. Uh, you know, back in, in the uh, early days, in the olden days, they had World Fairs, World's Fairs. And I went to the 1964 World Fair in New York in 1967, World's Fair up in Canada and so on. And at these fairs, every individual, and uh, every company and country has an individual pavilion based on a theme of their choice. And um, for example, back in 64, uh, Ford's pavilion theme was Mustang because the Mustang just came out. So we sat in cars in their pavilion and rode around in Mustangs to get us interested. Anyways, so the cold call that I got was there's going to be a World Expo in 2005 in Aichi, Japan. And Mitsubishi Company Corporation uh, is interested in considering your What If book as the theme of their pavilion. So instead of Mustangs, they had, you know. And so... Um, I talked with, with the, the fellow and we batted some ideas back and forth and I put together a, a proposal and uh, they bought it. Um, and it was interesting because this was back in 2005 before uh, uh, VR virtual reality came into existence. And, and so the, the show based on what if the moon didn't exist was a, a, essentially a total immersion. In other words, there were screens on all sides of the viewers and, and, and there were projections of activities on all sides so that they felt as if they were immersed in the environment, So, which was a very neat thing to do. And the, the, <clears throat> very briefly, the, the story was to explore uh, this the consequence of this because the moon I, I might add is very very important in Japanese culture that was what got me this that far and so uh, it, they decided to have a presentation by <laughs> me as a cartoon character and I will give credit where credit is due my wife chose what I was to look like they sent sent us about a half a dozen sketches of what the character was going to look like. And she chose the one that I am today. Anyway, so, so uh, we went to the opening of that and it was, it was just, it was a wonderful experience. It was a one year thing. The, the world expos are one year long. And uh, when it closed a resort in Southern Japan, house Tembosch, house in the forest in Dutch, uh, uh, came to me and said, uh, we would like to, uh, through Robot Inc., to give credit, uh, we would like to uh, buy the rights to your show. And I said, yeah, all right, force me. And, and they, they forced me. Uh, they made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And so uh, <clears throat> I helped them put together, you know, a, a re slightly revised version. But anyways... Uh, that show played every day, almost every day, for 17 years at the resort, House Tembosch, and just closed down for uh, last year. So for the last 17, 18 years, if you include uh, Mitsubishi, uh, I've been a cartoon character in Japan. So, And how does it feel? To be a <laughs> it's very satisfying, I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now on to the, what if the moon didn't exist? The, uh, <clears throat> the premise is that the moon never existed. That, that's what I'm constructing here. And it turns out in real life, 
in fact, when I you know give this presentation, I talk about the con consequences of the moon as it has been. In other words, not as it wouldn't be, but as it has been. And then you take away all of these things and you see how profoundly different the Earth would be. For example, when the moon first formed, we don't know exactly, but in round numbers, it was about 10 times closer than it is today. And as a result, the tides it created on the young Earth were, are you ready for this? 1,000 times higher than they are now. Wow. So 10, ten times closer, but 1,000 bigger at the time because of the, the influence. Because of the force of gravity. Yeah. 10 times 10 times 10. Wow. And therefore, like, you know, in, in, in Maine here where the, t the tides can be, say, 20 feet high, they would be 20,000 feet high if Maine had existed back then. Wow. Uh, which would ruin your whole day if you were <laughs> here in Maine. Anyways, the point is that that had a huge consequence for life on Earth. Specifically, those huge tides running in and out. And I, oh, I'm sorry, I should also say that the Earth was spinning faster. Again, we don't know how fast, but maybe as fast as four times faster than it is today. Six-hour day-ish. Um, and with the tides running in and out every you know, six hours, the amount of the, the surface of the, the young continents that was scraped by those tides and, and that debris put into the ocean really sped up the ability of life to form in the oceans because it, it, the building blocks were deposited as a result of those tides. So that has been, that was one of the major factors. Another factor is the, um, the earth was spinning so fast that the high tide, the, and there are two high tides on earth, one on the side of the moon, one on the other side. The high tide on the side of the earth closer to the moon was actually ahead. The earth was spinning so fast that if, if this was the moon and this was the earth with a high tide, the high tide is ahead of the moon, and this water here, this water here, it the, has gravity, and the gravity of the water is pulling the moon, is pulling the moon, like a ball on a string. If you have a ball on a string, you start spinning around, the ball will spiral outward. That's exactly what the moon is doing. The moon is spiraling away from the earth. As a result of the tides, it, the moon, creates on the earth. And in fact, I mean, one of the you know the things that I'm often asked, well, well, is it ever going to leave the Earth, the Moon? And the answer is no, because at the same time that the Moon is spiraling away, the Earth is slowing down. Why? Because the Earth is giving the Moon energy to spiral away. It's like you would give the ball on the string energy by spinning around. And that energy has to come from somewhere. And the energy that the moon gets from the gravity of the high tides comes from the Earth's rotation because the high tides are trying to get back under the moon. And then the, the, as that high tide water moves westward and it bumps into these nasty continents, and as the water bumps into the continents, it slows the Earth down. So the Earth going from, let's say, six hours back then to 24 hours now, it continues to slow. Eventually, eventually, the punchline is the moon is going to be much farther away, but the Earth will be spinning at the same rate that the moon is orbiting. And from then on, the high tide here and the moon will be lined up, and therefore there won't be any more pull from the high tide on the moon. So... That's going to happen. It's going to be billions and billions of years from now. So don't worry about it. The sun is going to blow up before then, anyway. So, don't be <laughs> no big deal. So, so the point is, if the moon didn't exist, all these things that you described, very good, and all men would not happen. So, in, so in simple world, it may even be that we didn't have uh, life. Good, I'm just making a guess. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, life would almost certainly have evolved, but the main, the main source 
of the the minerals in the ocean that life evolved from mm. would come from river runoff and from the sources of you know uh, heat and energy coming out of the bottom of the ocean in some places mm. but if you add up all of that those minerals compared to the minerals that the high tides made it it would have taken millions of years longer at least for life to have evolved number one and another thing is that the the rotation of the earth would be you know close to what it was back then and the reason i say close is because the sun today creates one third of our tides and therefore there would have been a little slowing but you know the day would be let's say eight hours long not 24 if the moon had never existed mm. and as a result of that you can then look at the the wind patterns from the heating and cooling of the rapidly spinning earth and you would get completely different weather patterns than we have today and from most of what I've been able to figure out, they would be much nastier weather than we have now. Wow. See, th this is the typical example of how you made it very easy to understand. You know, right. Given I, I like space, and I read, and, and uh, I'm passionate about it, but I'm far away from that. I'm a, I'm a doctor in political science, so yeah. don't, don't call me for help on a plane. But, uh, you know, I'm passionate about a lot of different things. But, of course, then I hear you and I'm like, Eric, I mean, you just made it so easy to understand, I think, for everyone. But also, as you're doing this, and I'm going to reconnect to the storytelling, I've asked myself a lot of questions. And I had a lot of scenario that could inspire very easily a ton of sci-fi movies and i'm connecting to the fact that you've been consulting if i'm not wrong with many uh, tv and radio radio science show so we know that some uh, book and stories and movie are based on completely fictional um, world i mean uh, tolkien created an entire middle earth and you can't go and tell him that well, that cannot exist because it's like, no, yeah, it can because I want it to exist. But other times you you try to play with the real science. You try to play with real history. Maybe you have an alternative history, uh, fiction, and, and so forth. So what is your uh, relationship with very creative mind that maybe want to create and go away too far from reality? I mean, are, are you a fan of complete fantasy or your science background always brings you back to, that's too much, <laughs> you know, no, calm down? Absolutely, no, that's a really great question. Uh, the short answer is that when it gets too far away, <laughs> I put on the brakes. Uh, in other words, I, I try to make it so, the, you know, the, the, the science fiction, if you will, that. I have, you know, been asked about. Uh, I try to make it as realistic as possible, and uh, sometimes that you know takes people in different directions. But uh, when it gets to be complete fantasy, and don't get me wrong, it, that's a, a nice genre. Uh, it, it's not where I am interested in being. Mm. So I, I try to to sort of stay close and close enough to science so that when people hear or see things, they would say, hmm, I wonder, rather than, oh, no, that's not it. That's not the real thing. Mm. So if I want to go to space and I have, on one hand, I'm at the, at the bookstore and I have the Traveler's Guide to Space, which you wrote, and I have the Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy, from Adams, which one should I get? <laughs> uh, well, I would say the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And the only pro problem with that, I, I honestly don't recall that I named it. I think my agent named it. Unfortunately, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Space, when people see it, they think, oh, it's going to be like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy or the Universe. Whatever. And it's not. <laughs> And it's not. And it's not. Well, that's why I made the joke. Yeah. One is 
a little bit off <laughs> in a lot of way. I think it's super funny, especially when he's bred. Oh yeah, uh, but totally. uh, but yeah, most certainly very detached from from reality. Yeah, <laughs> from science. Totally agree. Yeah, but it's still yeah. enjoyable. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, what is your next uh, adventure in terms of writing? Do you do you have any other plan and and also, have you ever thought about writing something that is, um, yeah, I mean, I guess you already answered to that, but a little bit more of a fictional story. Funny you should ask that question. It's not that you were prompt. I mean, you know, no? you were coming up with that by yourself. I uh, I'm working on two projects right now. One of them is a memoir, and there's a deep background in that. Um, but I am exploring, you know, my early years and, and why I had them and what I did and, and what I got out of it. And I've been encouraged to do that by a number of people. And the other is science fiction. I'm writing a science fiction novel taking place up around numbers 100 years from now with a minimum amount of fiction built in, but some, uh, specifically uh, to enable you know, the, the players in the story to be able to, to travel uh, faster than, uh, well, faster than the speed of light. Um, but uh, I do it in such a way that it's not implausible that this could exist. It, it, it just, it would take, uh, it, it would take science a while to, to make changes in the state of, of our, our technology. And if they can make those changes, then conceivably, you know, this could happen. So it's, it's on the, again, on the boundary between science and science fiction. Mm -hmm. Those are my two projects right now. And I didn't know, I, I swear, I, did, I wasn't prompted on this. So I'm glad I asked the question. Yeah. Uh, I would like to end this with, um, Something about maybe your habits in in or your taste in in reading and maybe watching movies. So as a scientist, as a writer of things that are very connected to to reality to a certain point. Now the, going on that adventure as well, that journey. Right. What's your favorite genre? I mean, as a, as a professor, as an astrophysics, do you just right. people imagine that you just read about that? But I'm sure that you may read, enjoy something else. Maybe, I don't know, you watch Disney. What do you do on your free time? <laughs> What's your favorite story? If I had free time, I would. <laughs> if I had. If um, question, again, an if yeah, question. Yeah, right. What if I had free time? Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, the realm that I like reading in most would, when it's not you know, hard science is the history of science scientists. The history of Einstein, uh, the history of Niels Bohr, um, the history of, of Isaac Newton, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's it's just interesting to see, you know, where they came from and how they got to where they ended up. Uh, I find that very interesting because, in, quite honestly, in, in some cases, you know, it could potentially uh, help move me forward. Uh, so so that that is one of my my major uh, uh, areas or genres uh, other than, uh, as I say, other than, than the hard science. Um, I also read uh, books uh, or materials uh, by uh, uh, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, yeah. I love yeah, that. We, we met 1994 on a bus in San Diego. This gentleman comes up to me and he says, excuse me, are you Neil Cummins? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, hello, I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Nice to meet you. And we've been friends ever since. So, I love it. Um, well, he's definitely one of those uh, that inspire me. I, I love his shows. I, I When I stroll, scroll through uh, Instagram often, you know, Instagram knows me better than myself. <laughs> uh, once you start watching a few things, 
he knows you play the bass and that you like uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson quotes on the astronomy. So <laughs> it's, it, he's another one of those person and that uh, another guy, professional like you, that um, that just breaks it down. Right, mm. it's it, exactly. it does it, it makes it interesting. He's a good, he's an excellent storyteller, and so, Sorry. and so are you. And uh, there is another guy. Um, I don't remember his first name. He's uh, uh, Cox. Is his last name? He's from the UK. Um, he's also in astrophysics, and he he had a show. And it, same thing, like kind of the same style, a little bit more rock and roll uh, mm. looking type of guy i think actually used to sing in a band or something but anyway again it it doesn't have to be boring and that's the difference right when you when you exactly. look at that and one last note on on the biography i i didn't grow up reading biography but i got really interested in that and um, especially isaacson biography on einstein which is the one mm. i'm actually reading now the one on steve job one on Leonardo da Vinci, which is excellent. And it just makes you contextualize things when to to do what they could with what they had. Mm -hmm. Right? They didn't have computer. They didn't have exactly. all the data, the now generative AI and all that. But their head was so ahead of the time that probably a lot of people thought they were a little nuts, to be honest. <laughs> um one one yeah uh, fair enough one last uh, cute thing uh, i was approached uh, concerning in the realm of what if the moon didn't exist i was approached by uh, a fellow at the university of illinois chad lane who asked if i would work with him to get an nsf grant to incorporate my what if scenarios into you ready for this minecraft mm, i and can so see that we have been doing that for several years now and also creating uh, versions of uh, Minecraft with exoplanet properties. And uh, that's that's been doing very well. It's, it's well received, shall we say. I love it. See, I'm telling you, what if is the question. And w what if I had this entire conversation <laughs> without Neil next to me? It would have been damn boring, yeah. but it wasn't. So, I Neil, I want to thank you so much for taking the time again i know you're super busy and i'm excited for all your upcoming project and uh door is open anytime you have a new story i i enjoy listening i'm quite sure the audience did the same so i will put all the links to uh your books and uh way to get in touch with you on the notes on the podcast or youtube if you're watching us there and um subscribe to audio signal podcast so you can get more story like this there's a bunch coming up and uh neil again anytime come back good luck with your new venture and uh I'm, i think i i have to read that uh, if the moon didn't exist so i'm gonna go i'm gonna go get it uh, on amazon okay, i'm sure i will take care everybody thank you neil talk My to you pleasure. soon bye bye, bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Audio Signals with Marco Ciappelli. If you learned something new and this conversation made you think, then add this show to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and share the ITSP Magazine Podcast Network with your friends, family, and colleagues. If you represent a company and wish to connect your brand to our conversations and our audience, visit itspmagazine.com to learn how to sponsor one or more of our shows. We hope you will come back for more stories and follow us on our journey. Insights, solutions, and networking all come together at RSA Conference. Join a global cybersecurity community at rsaconference.com forward slash ITSP MAG24.